So beyond ethnography, what does that mean? What's that about? And in my initial dialogue with Marilee, basically I said, I like the ethnographical work, I think it's very interesting, but I really think we're missing some things if we focus exclusively on ethnographic methods and understanding our user communities. And I talked to her about my concerns, which will be the, the um, I'll describe more in, in the talk, and they come from the many campus visits that I have done um, over the, um, the past few years. And in addition, I review manuscripts for three journals, and I see many, many, many um, articles that have as a title or subtitle, ethnographic study of, and, you know, and, and then, then the rest of it. So my concerns, um, both from my visits and from some of the uh, manuscripts that I review are first, that I think sometimes the interviewees, <coughs> the researchers, are asking a really limited set of questions or doing really minimal observations. And we heard this morning about, um, I think it was at Johns Hopkins, where they were do, did a year-long uh, worth of observations with many, many hours of study and, and good training. But I have seen manuscript articles, and probably my, um, the example I had the most concern with was literally observations during one week for two hours a day by a student. And what concerns me about this is that librarians are drawing conclusions that will shape the way they want to offer services and reconfigure their physical spaces. And I think that is a problem for us to not really understand um, what the methods can contribute and how to do a robust methodology. So the second um, thing that concerns me, especially from the campus visits, is that I realize, as do all of you, in fact, show of hands, how many of you think even the majority, even just a little more than 50% of your user population knows about almost everything you have, meaning content, and almost every type of service or facility you offer? How many think over 50%, even if it's 51%, know that? Show of hands. So that, that's what I think, too. And so if our user community doesn't even know what we're doing now, how can they think about the future? And so how can we plan not just physical spaces, but future services if people don't even understand what we're doing now? And the third um, concern that I have has been brought up by several of our speakers, and that is that we need to focus on libraries and librarians' roles, and for this audience primarily, in their higher education uh, institution. So if it's a public library, obviously in their community. And focus not as the library itself, but the library's role in teaching, learning, and research, or whatever other aspects of the institutional mission are important. So I, I don't intend this to be um, a complaining or critical talk. Instead, what I want to do is to focus on some really great examples that I've found that I think are looking at things in new ways and to give you some ideas of how you might want to go beyond ethnography, not dismiss ethnography, but go beyond it. So I'll start with asking good questions. And I think that this um, is undervalued as librarians um, begin some of their projects. How many of you have either 
uh, LibGuides or some other similar software that you have uh, for your library. Show of hands, you know, just about everybody has them. And I imagine almost all of you have looked at your statistics. So on the right-hand side of the slide, how many hits do you have, say, each semester? Which guides are the most popular? How can you, some of you may do usability studies, things like seeing if users will actually scroll down the page and where do their eyes focus on the page. So, and what, what do you do with that information? Well, if it's a really popular one, maybe you'll revise it more frequently. If something's not used at all, maybe you'll take it off the website and for not, not put your time into it anymore. If you do a usability study, you might redesign some of the pages, etc. I all of those things are worthwhile. So I, I want to be clear that I think a lot of existing studies have merit, but the question on the left posed by, in an interview of a new um, research center at the Harvard Libraries, they said that they were investigating our lib guides serving the research problems our students actually have. Now that is a question asking about the library in the life of the user. That's a really different question than looking at hits or looking at where your eye falls on the page. Okay, and this is not an easy question necessarily to answer, but I want to draw the distinction between some of the data that we collect. And you'll see that I don't, um, in terms of, of thinking about data, I'm very interested in qualitative data. It's always been my own personal bent, although I like quantitative data, particularly as it uh, iterates back and forth, as Lynn described so well, that you learn certain things from surveys, certain things from interviews or other qualitative methods, and each helps you understand what you're gaining or what you're gleaning from the other method. There are always things that are unclear um, in, in no matter what method you use. So these two types of questions can complement each other. Here's another example. Um, most of you probably have chat services, and you probably have a button or a link on your home page that says, talk to a librarian. It might even say, the librarian's available right now. Or you might use the, I don't know if it's still the OCLC service, where the, it's a cooperative, and you can ha talk to anyone anytime because it's dispersed in different time zones. Lots of people, lots of libraries have that available. And you've probably looked at, if you have such a service, the people in public services probably looked at your statistics. How does the use vary over the course of the semester? How does it vary in terms of hours of the day and days of the week? Or you might do a survey, either, either right at the end of a question or a random sample of, of users. Are your users satisfied? And you might even do a, a deep dive into the transcripts and, say, and look at how does the use of this type of online service compare to your in-person questions. All of those are very valid things to do. And I imagine that the libraries who then moved to the step on the right had done this work and said something isn't working quite right. And that's where I was taken by Paul Heath's comment um, yesterday that looking at what people are doing and then reimagining it. You know something's not working quite right. Gee, you thought this would be so popular, but it isn't that popular. It's not that well used. You don't really know what the problem is. So I'll show you two examples of libraries, and one asked this question. Can the use of a business-oriented software product that is proactive in reaching users improve the use of our library chat service? And this was a, a study at, a, I think, a small university called um, the John Carroll University, and they employed this new um, customer service model they got from a lot of shopping websites. So instead of the user saying, I want to talk to a librarian, certain types of um, searches, probably you know 404 or zero hits, or I'm sure they had a number of parameters, pr were called triggers. And those triggers made a pop-up box appear that said, do you have a question? Are you having difficulty or whatever it was it said? So it's push.
And they increased their transactions from 3% to 21%. I mean, that's a pretty big change. And that of their chat, 70% initiated by Trigger, not by the patrons. But this is the most important thing, I think, that 74% of these Trigger chats were reference research chats. That's the goal that all librarians want to get to. You know, you can have lots of staff available to where's the bathroom and, and what, at what time are you closing. But what we're very concerned about are these diminishing reference statistics. Because public service librarians know students don't know a lot of things. They do actually have difficulty finding information, but somehow we're just not connecting with them and getting them to ask the questions. And I became um, very interested in this when I sat in on one of our sessions at a CNI meeting, actually a couple of years ago, by librarians at University of Texas San Antonio who did a very similar project. And what, and they have an article coming out in College and Research Libraries, I think in about a month. Um, and uh, so you'll, you'll find it there. But the title of it, I think, is revealing. Changes in reference question complexity following the implementation of a proactive chat system. So when they showed in the presentation at CNI some of the questions that students asked when the chat box popped up and they took advantage of it, they re really were often interdis interdisciplinary or uh, you know, just a very complex kind of health sciences issue. I was really taken by the questions because they are exactly what we wish we were working with, with students. And so I think, you know, this is the kind of user research that can also be really helpful to us. So I do a lot of work um, visiting libraries who are planning renovated facilities and services. So I always hope that people will couple the renovation of their facilities with thinking about how they might want to offer new services. And they of, often ask and have done some work perhaps before I come, often using the ethnographic methods, and they focus a lot on how students like to study and some common things that they're observing and taking and collecting data on. Do students like to work alone or in groups, with or without noise? at various levels of noise, near windows, with light, at large or small tables, in enclosed rooms or open spaces, with or without someone nearby to provide assistance. Again, all of these are very logical, they're interesting. To be honest, I think we might have enough data on this. I'm not sure it varies that much institution to institution that I think if you're going into a renovation, you can get a lot of what you need from the studies that have already been published. What I'd like to see more libraries asking about or asking students is how can you support their learning? And then you might have students talking more about they would really like to create media or they'd really like to make a physical object, or they'd like to uh, collect and analyze data in new ways, perhaps through a data visualization. I think that we found at Tennessee, while they didn't ask that question of their user population, they started observing learning activities, and that's when they provided the green screen room, right? The, the media, and I think they did a couple of other things. So you can, you can gather this data, it doesn't have to be interviews, they did it through observation. But they were going beyond um, the studying, what we normally think of as studying, into learning. The same with services. Um, here I reflect on Lorcan's comment in the opening session yesterday about moving from bureaucracy to enterprise. I think of the questions we have under the usual reflect the bureaucratic approach. This is what libraries do. This is what we believe we do well. This is what we think we have the expertise in. So we ask students or we collect data on how they use databases and catalogs, using some primary sources, 
finding a nice plot spot, whether quiet or collaborative to study, and asking assistance. Again, those are valid questions. They, they're, they're useful to know. But what I'm seeing lacking is thinking more broadly in the enterprise, libraries as an enterprise, what about advice on intellectual property issues? I know uh, many of you in this room have libraries that are doing it, but I'm not seeing that come up on most of the user surveys. What about assistance with students in undergraduate research or your graduate students who are going to present their first poster at a, a regional or national conference? A lot of them need some assistance doing that, whether with formatting or getting permission or even actually printing. Um, there are a number of libraries, again, people represented in this room whose libraries have big plotters. But do students even know those things exist? How about creating a video incorporating images from special collections? Do you think that's something that students and faculty might be interested in? Are you asking about that? Would your, your community even imagine that you could help them with that? or developing a data visualization. It's something that you know more and more um, research is represented through visualizations. Now pulling back to the more um, kind of a, a, a more specific level, this just happens to be one of my issues right now. When I visit libraries, I make it a point to see how many students are using the large screens in group study rooms or in group areas like in the diner booths or other places. Now, partly I do this out of guilt because I'm someone who recommended that libraries put screens all over the place. But unfortunately, I find when I'm visiting these libraries, hardly any of them are being used. Okay, now, if we just observed that and did a count, we would just stop putting those screens in libraries, right? I took this photo when I visited University of Central Florida because one of the first times I saw a small group using a screen in a way that I imagined they would be doing it. What I don't know is, are students working on these screens at night when they're perhaps spending more time concerted time in the library? I don't know. I'm not usually in the libraries at night. What I don't know is if libraries actually put a small sign that says, connect to this screen and step one, step two, and you you're go, I rarely see that. I don't know if students know they have permission to connect. I don't know if students know how to connect. So if we just observe and do counts on who are screens being used or not, we aren't actually going to have the answer to whether we need them. Are we promoting them in instruction classes to um, to groups that to classes that have group assignments and that have visual kinds of materials? Do students even know they can come to the library and use these? So here's one of my suggestions. I think we need to help our users imagine the future, and there's nothing better than visuals in doing that, whether taking a group to visit a library or, more realistically, when you're meeting with groups of faculty or students, and I've done this on a number of campuses, I will usually show them in like five or 10 minutes some examples of interesting things that are going on in actual libraries before I start asking them questions about what they might like to see. Now, you might, some of the real researchers in this room may say I'm, I'm biasing the results. But my concern is most people do not think a library is going to have a big game lab. So why in the world would they even mention that? They just would not have the conception. And if you show something like this, and some, some faculty, and you choose your examples carefully, of course, but you show them this, and then you say, NC State's computer science department has one of the top-rated game design programs in the country. This is not a game lab for having fun, although they do open it for students for leisure. It's totally available when it's not being used for research and instruction. But 
tying that and saying, what are the programs at your university or your institution who need some high-end technologies that's not currently available? Because if you put it into the library, as has happened at NC State, it's not just computer science that's using it. It's English and it's literature and Kim, uh, Kim and, uh, and a new Vedantham at Penn, and I wrote an article I'll show you in a, in a minute. Uh, what are some of the other areas, Kim? Can you, do you? Um, graduate students and uh, taking a war film class, creative okay. and exhibit. Okay, so graduate students uh, creating a war film exhibit used it. There, there are you know, quite a few examples outside of computer science of uh, classes and students using the facility. <coughs> How many of your um, users even know what Arduino is? I mean, it, that was a new one on me a little while ago. Um, and it's a circuit board um, intended for kind of elementary use by people uh, starting to get into coding. So this is a workshop being, uh, taking place at McMaster University in Canada. And if you showed um, a photo of this, people would not only get an idea of new kinds of spaces and technologies, but standing up in, in the middle is a librarian giving this workshop. So it, this is one way you communicate to your users that librarians have a broader set of skills than they might have imagined, okay? Or that we saw this also yesterday, the new makerspace in the older library at NC State, the Hill Library again, the staff and the kinds of classes and individuals they're working with, the range of projects is just so impressive. Or I'm seeing very small numbers, but this is also quite interesting, um, startup places um, or um, innovation workshops for students. This one at Georgia Tech was in the most, I'd call it humble facility. So it didn't have a lot of the technology in it at the time. They're doing a major renovation and I hope they'll be um, continuing this. But one thing that I found particularly important was on the sign for it, first of all, you know, they really encourage people to come and use it. But they say, utilize Georgia Tech resources for market research, multimedia development, and patent information. So they're drawing these direct connections between what they have and library content and services. And then we know the humanities faculty are often the hardest nut to crack. And I've met with a number of groups and when libraries recruit faculty to help with planning, whether it's strategic planning or space planning, the volunteers are often um, humanities faculty that have gray hair like I do. They're, in, they're senior faculty who have often very traditional ideas of what libraries are about. And I do have a humanities background. I'm sympathetic to it. I just think we need both. I think we need the traditional and we need the modern. What I have found most effective in working with these faculty is to give them a notion of what some students or faculty are doing in digital projects to give them an idea of what can be accomplished in new media. And I'm going to read this to you because it, I just love this example that I saw at University of Calgary. Engaging in and seeking out collaborations and special projects is another way the Digital Media Center, which is part of the library, advocates for advancement in and support of digital media creation. So not just access to, but content creation. One example involved the collaboration of the Digital Media Center and the legend of the giant skunk. After attending a Digital Media Center workshop on creating image mashups, so you know, an innovative type of workshop the library was offering, Indigenous Studies instructor and one of the Media Commons, the manager, with the assistant of student staff, so you can see this collaboration involved, began working on animating the Cree legend of the giant skunk.
The project culminated in a multimedia presentation and discussion with the Indigenous Studies class, so it was embedded in a course, and the, the session was held in a learning lab on, uh, in the, within the library. And they, in, as part of the class, they held a video conference with the elder, Lewis Bird, whom you see on the left, of one of the Cree tribes in Ontario, which is at quite a distance from Calgary, as Lewis told the legend of the giant skunk in his native tongue to the class, the visual animation of the story was displayed to the class on the digital displays. It was a moving and powerful experience for all in attendance that evening in the Taylor Family Digital Library. So wouldn't you like to be doing projects like that with your faculty? And wouldn't you want to showcase this as a demonstration of the skills that librarians have, the marrying of digital content, the performance aspects, and this screen is an exhibit in the library, so it gives an idea of what's possible in that space. So I think these kinds of things are, are really important. So when um, in the many, many, many years I was a student, I guess you're always a student, but a formal student, I think one of the things that was most important to me to learn was when developing research questions challenge underlying assumptions. And I think what we need to do as we work with our user communities is first to challenge our own professional assumptions of what we have to do and what we should be doing, and then challenge those of your users who often have really limited views of librarians and libraries. So I'm going to segue um, over a little bit into ethnography, and this is uh, one of the uh, important sites where you can get a lot of information on employing ethnographic methods, working, especially observing students. But I was really taken by this interview, and this is just a small segment, between David Green of the Aerial Project, um, and it was published in CNRL News. And the question the interviewer had was, the aerial studies refer to teaching faculty as gatekeepers and brokers between the students and librarians. Do more substantial librarian-faculty relationships make a difference, encouraging faculty to refer their students to librarians for discipline-related content-specific help? And the answer was, the fact that faculty are gatekeepers is both good and bad. It's hard to reach out directly to students and make a big difference. But at least we know to whom our outreach should be directed. Teaching faculty have the power to make the difference libraries need. And another study, um, how did students know, this is a totally different study, um, how did students know they could schedule research consultations? And, and, and again, I consider this kind of the gold standard of, of library reference these days. 51% said the professor of my class suggested it. 37% the librarian talked about it during his or her visit to my class. But in that class visit, the librarian is um, given an imprimatur by the faculty member. So you see the 51 and the 37 have a lot to do with the faculty member saying, this is something I uh, I suggest this is something that is a good thing. The faculty member has a huge role. So it really concerns me when we look at how um, students study that we're leaving out this very, very key person, the faculty member. I think sometimes we think of students quote, studying as kind of free agents. Oh, they walk in the library to study. They're walking in the library primarily and I don't have data to back this up, to work on course assignments given by faculty members. And we can't lose that connection. We have to connect as much with faculty as we do with students, in my opinion. And so Kim and another colleague, Anuvan Anthem, and I wrote this article um, that talks about that, and you'll find the site it's, um, in Educause Review. I also liked um, Shirley's comment about finding extreme users. And this appeared recently in the education issue of the New York Times. It was an article by Stephen Greenblatt 
And he said, but I was discovered in my teaching, it's a different Shakespeare from the one with whom I first fell in love. Many of the students uh, may have less verbal acuity than in past years, uh, but they often possess highly developed visual, musical, and performative skills. They intuitively grasp, in a way I came to understand only slowly, the pervasiveness of songs in Shakespeare's plays, the strange ways that his scenes flow one into another. We think of reading rather than the theater, right? Um, me, we, meaning people of my age group, um, and the alternation of close-ups and long views. When I ask them to write a 10-page paper analyzing a particular web of metaphors or complex theme, the results are often wooden. Now, he's not saying that they're bad or they're not well thought out, but they're wooden. Oh, and I didn't mention he's teaching at Harvard. These are Harvard students. Then he goes on to say, but when I ask them to analyze a film clip, perform, so act of learning a scene, make a video, I stand a better chance, not just of re receiving something good, receiving something extraordinary. This does not mean I should abandon the paper assignment, and that's important. It's an important form of training for a range of very different challenges that lie in their future. But I see that their deep, imaginative engagement with Shakespeare, their intoxication lies elsewhere. Isn't that fascinating? I, I just really love that. And we, if we identify these extreme users, or these potentially extreme users, those are the people that we should work with because they're going to show us where they're taking pedagogy in the future. I also think um, that we can introduce faculty if they haven't found it at your institution to something called the degree qualifications profile. That is a, a set of, came, the latest version came out about two years ago. It's a set of, um, of behaviors or uh, outcomes, they, they'll talk about why they chose this uh, degree qualifications terminology more extensively in the document of what should be accomplished by the end of a baccalaureate degree and a master's level program. And these are just two things I pulled out. It's a, you know, maybe a 20 page document. So the, they're saying that at the end of the bachelor's, um, students should be able the student constructs sustained coherent arguments, narratives or explications of issues, problems, or technical issues and processes. But what's important is they say in writing and at least one other medium, okay? They're also saying negotiates a strategy for group research and performance. Okay, this is new. We don't have a lot out there that really describes this in a meaningful way for faculty. And I think we can help introduce faculty to the academic nature of some of these new types of projects. And we can show them websites like the media projects at Dartmouth and show them the quote by the Harvard professor to make them understand this is not just fun and games, it's academic work. So here are some questions, and I know they've, some of them have been used and expanded um, at University of uh, Colorado Denver. Uh, Mary Somerville has used some of these and others uh, for faculty and departments and schools. Are you planning a significant curriculum revision? If yes, can the library help achieve some objectives? Which faculty are developing innovative assignments or wish to, but due to limitations with currently available facilities, equipments, and services, are experiencing difficulties or unable to do so? So these will help them look, help you work with them to look into the future and linking teaching and learning to what they might do with a library. So I decided, I've been thinking a lot about this phrase, library in the life of the user. And I decided since it's um, towards the end of the afternoon, you needed a little interlude before I do the wrap up. I only have two slides after this interlude. And I wanted to say, I don't have to just talk about curriculum. I do believe that the affective domain is very important. 
that Tennessee work has really informed my thinking about the sense of community for students. When Teresa and colleagues gave that presentation a few years ago, and she said they didn't leave that university because they were failing or because they couldn't afford it. They left it because they they couldn't find community. That is such an important finding and ways to de-stress from the pressures of academic life. So I just thought I'd de-stress you before you get on your various modes of transportation and talk about the kinds of lovely spaces we can provide our students for lounging and relaxing in cold climates. I love the idea of fireplaces. We have someone from Vassar here, and the fireplace, when you come into that building, is just a warming thing on a cold night. Taking a break in a communal activity, the puzzles at the Ohio University Library, you can either work as a group or people can come sequentially and add to the project, just like you do at home, at least at our house at the holidays. Uh, there's snack machines and then uh, various board games set up uh, at the Chinese University of Hong Kong. And I know at Louisiana State, uh, you have an area similar to that. The food and drink in the library, giving students a lovely place to relax, sometimes providing them with food that comes from local purveyors who, you know, stress uh, locally sourced and, and organic foods like they do at Calgary and some other places. And then we know what an impact lovely outdoor environments, beautiful natural places have in calming us when we're under stress. It's a lovely garden. It didn't always look this way out in, in the courtyard at UMass and the beautiful furniture, colorful furniture on the patio of a very nondescript building, the Hill Library at NC State. Uh, the, the library I worked in many years ago at Mann, they didn't have this garden at the time. Landscape architecture is one of the programs for that that library serves, so it's particularly fitting. Again, um, the older part of the building is the, one of the ugliest things you'd ever see. <laughs> the garden is just beautiful. Adding artwork, I was entranced by this uh, sculptural piece in the Learning Garden. I love the name, too, the Learning Garden at the Chinese University of Hong Kong. The light filters in from a skylight, and you'll see the, the traditional calligraphy in the background or the really enjoyable sculptures at Brigham Young, one more of a serious contemplative reader and the other just a silly kind of sculpture with uh, bicyclists and books. Also at Brigham Young, they put up this big paper in their learning commons and they invite all the freshmen to sign it. That's the way, the, you know, it's a community thing. That's saying, I belong, I'm part of this class. Really simple, costs practically nothing. Or again, at, um, in Hong Kong, they told me about, the, the board was still up, um, but the exam time was over, and I asked them to send me a photo, which they did. Best of luck for exams. So students wrote notes to each other and posted them on this board. So again, sense of hum community. At McMaster, outside of their uh, digital media center, they had, um, the, I believe a staff member wrote the wouldn't it be cool and students just added some things like um, making um, uh, 3D printed parts for bicycles. Okay, very good, interesting suggestion. Maybe it already exists and some were just kind of um, silly but just an another way for people to contribute. Or one of my all time favorites, the uh, My Hunt Library on Instagram at NC State, which is on the web but also has this visual presence on a big display in the library. So back to the serious stuff for a wrap up. Um, my suggestions for moving forward, asking good questions that will yield meaningful, actionable responses. And when studying students, it's very useful to observe them and to get their diaries and all of those things, but it is an incomplete picture in my view. What might students use if they knew what you offer now or what you could offer in the future if they had some notions of that? What would they do if you worked with faculty to develop new kinds of assignments? 
And I also want to reiterate that I encourage you to seed conversations with examples, especially visuals. It has a lot of impact on how people then respond to new suggestions about the library. I also think you must keep in mind the broader institutional context. We've heard that from a number of speakers. Who is monitoring the strategic directions in your institution, both in research and teaching and learning? How are you keeping abreast of developments in pedagogy and technology? How can the library become a partner with faculty? <clears throat> and how are you creating a sense of community for your users? All of these are challenging things. Think carefully about where you put your scarce resources into understanding the library and the life of the user. Thank you. <laughs>